Welcome back, folks, to Wrestle Rants. I'm Graham G.S. and Matthews. All February long, we're breaking down every installment in WWE No Way Out history as seen on the WWE Network. Today, we're talking about No Way Out 2004. So kicking off the show, without a doubt, was for the tag team titles, two on three handicap match, Rikishi and Scott Etihadi defending against the Basham brothers and Shaniqua. So I think I've talked about Shaniqua here before on the show. I don't know what pay-per-view it was. The Bashams have been around for a long time. Because I'm pretty sure they were around in like early 05, weren't they? Because didn't Eddie and Ray beat them for the belts? I, they did, because they already watched No Way Out 05. They beat them for the belts in the opener. And they were around in late 03 too. So it must have been like fucking No Mercy 03 or some shit like that. It must have been, because they beat Eddie and Shavo for the belts, didn't they? So I'm, I'm pretty sure they've been around for a while. It's Shaniqua in their corner. I, I don't know. I like the Bajams as a tag team. They never really stood out to me as anything like anything above average. They were a solid tag team, but it, just because they were twins doesn't mean like they were like the Usos. I have a lot more fun watching the Usos in the ring than I do the Bajam brothers. They were a good team, but nothing. They didn't really stand the test of time. But anyway, Shaniqua was with them for a time in late 03, early 04, this time included. It was just weird. It wasn't even a bad... I don't even know what to describe it. Like, the whole sex dungeon thing I thought was so bizarre. And that's what this match was. Rikishi ended up pinning her and beating the shit out of her in the end. Sitting on her to beat them. Um, to, pinned her and won. So, I, I don't know. It was just weird. The match wasn't bad. It was just a very strange match. But at least they kept the belts on Rikishi and Scotty Duhati. That was the important thing. After that, we had Jamie Noble taking on Nydia in a blindfold match. Or at least Jamie Noble was blindfolded, not Nydia. And this was all because they had been together for a while. Nydia won Tough Enough. She was the one of the winners alongside Maven of the first season of Tough Enough as the female winner. She got paired with Jamie Noble pretty much right off the bat. They were together for a little bit over a year on WWE TV. And then from there, Nydia got blinded from Black Mist from Tajiri. She was blinded for a while. She got cured. And when she was blinded, Jamie Noble broke up with her and setting that Nydia was uh, sucking his inheritance dry, which I guess was the term that he used um, earlier on in the evening on this show. In the pretty match video package or whatever. So they had a match at No Way Out and for uh, Jamie Noble to kind of get a, a taste of the pain that Nydia had when she was blinded. They put a blindfold on Jamie Noble. So basically, this was a comedy match galore with Jamie Noble almost getting to second base with Nydia and chasing her all around the ring. And Nydia just kind of kicking him in the ass a couple times. And in the end, Jamie Noble would, I think, he would hit him. He would hit her with something and he would pin her for the one, two, three, and he ended up winning the match, as he should have. But the whole thing was comedy. The pairing was fine for what it was. Gave jo Jamie Noble something to do. Probably his most notable run in WWE. Um, so it was a fine match, and Jamie Noble won. It was comedy galore. So like I said, it was short, sweet, and to the point. Can't really complain. After that, we just had a standard tag team match, pitting the world's greatest tag team against the APA, Benjamin and Haas against Brad Sean Farouk. A good match. There was really nothing on the line, so it was just kind of there. This was around the time that we had just smacked on pay-per-view, so they had to spread the roster thin a little bit and give us matches for the sake of giving us matches. They couldn't do that to save their lives nowadays. Imagine if we had a pay-per-view this day and age with only half the roster. They can barely give us a pay-per-view with the entire roster. And I'm talking about if everyone was healthy, okay? If everyone on the current roster was healthy and they gave us a pay-per-view, a three-hour pay-per-view with half the roster, that'd be next to impossible. They can never do that. So I'm surprised, you know, they were able to do it back in 2004. I know the roster was a lot more loaded back then with two separate brands, but, you know, um, nowadays it just... You couldn't even imagine, you couldn't even fathom something like that happening. But anyway, um, nothing on the line in this match. I'm pretty sure the world's greatest tag team would win the belts from Rikishi and Scott Atuati at some point before Mania, because I believe they went into Mania as the defending champions, right? So this was a good match, very well wrestled. I'm glad the world's greatest tag team won with a super kick. That was a cool finish, and uh, they won the match. So setting up their future run with the tag team titles. After that, we had Hardcore Holly, or even before that, we had Brock Lesnar coming out. Um, after Goldberg had been giving a seat to ringside as invited by Stone Cold Steve Austin, who was the then, or one of the, one half of the Raw general managers at that time alongside Eric Bischoff. Goldberg confronted Brock Lesnar in the middle of the ring after their confrontation in the Royal Rumble match when Brock Lesnar attacked Goldberg and cost him the, uh, the Royal Rumble win, setting up their match at WrestleMania. So they confronted each other on this show. They brawled. 
Goldberg just went right after Lesnar, and Goldberg got the better of Brock Lesnar. Just beat the living shit out of him. And again, this was great. I thought the build for the match was really, really good. While the match itself was, you know, total poop, the build, I thought, was great. Like, you really wanted to see these two go you guys go at it in the middle of the ring at WrestleMania. So it was a great build. The match itself, of course, left a lot to be desired. Um, but anyway, great angle. Then um, before the next segment, Hardcore Holly came out for his match. And then Brock Lesnar ran away from the ring. So <laughs> I thought it was funny. To see Brock Lesnar running away from Hardcore Holly. And, you know, then in reality, though, it's not that surprising. Like, I know in Storyline they had their history and Lesnar squashed him in like seven minutes of the Rumble. And Hardcore Holly was never really anything above a lower mid-card guy for most of his career in WWE. But in real life, he's a tough son of a bitch. Like, he was known for beating the shit out of the, of the uh, tough enough kids. Like, legitimately, like, beating respect into them earlier on in, like, the 2000s and the early seasons of Tough Enough. So, that's what he was notorious for. So, Lesnar running away really isn't that much of a stretch now that I think about it. But anyway, that led into Hardcore Holly versus Rhino. Fine match. Probably got a little bit more time than I probably would have given them at almost 10 minutes because there was really nothing on the line. It was there. Rhino's a good worker. Holly's a good worker. It was an average match. Something you would see on SmackDown that really didn't stand out as special in my opinion. But again, you got to spread the roster thin for a three-hour pay-per-view with one brand, so I get it. Hardcore Holly wins with the Alabama Slam. I don't even think he was a part of WrestleMania. He might have been in some battle royal, but he wasn't. He sure as hell wasn't getting like a mega push in Mania, so for him to get as much focus as he was on the road to WrestleMania, but not being a top spot on the card was a little weird. Not that he even deserved it, or, you know, he should have been in the top spot on the card, but I just thought it was strange how much focus they gave him as a character in the first few months of 2004, yet they did nothing with him for the remainder of the year. But that was that. I think he got hurt, didn't he? Again? I don't know. Anyway, after that, we had for the Cruiserweight Championship, Rey Mysterio defending against Chavo Guerrero. Great match, man. Great match. These guys had a multi-month feud throughout 2004 for that championship. Matches at No Way Out. Uh, Cruiserweight Invitational WrestleMania that came down to just those two. Another match, I believe, at Judgment Day. And another match at Great American Bash. These guys had a long, strong series of matches for this championship. With Rey Mysterio put in chase mode by losing the belt here. Even from an in-ring standpoint, they got a lot of great time. Almost 20 minutes you know, the second longest match second longest match in the entire show. Um, even longer than the next match, which we'll get to in a second. A number one contenders match for the WWE Championship. And almost 20 minutes long. Really, really good match. Guerrero in the end with some help from Chavo Classic, his um his uncle. Or no, his his father, rather, I'm sorry. Um ended up winning the match in a very in a really, really good match. And to win the Cruiserweight Championship. So both Eddie and Chavo won gold on the same show, and Chavo's talked about it before how special of a night was for was for him and Eddie because they both won gold on the same show after, you know, facing off the Rumble, going their separate ways, and then going on to win championships and no way out. So that was pretty cool. Nice little parallel there. But yeah, great match between Chavo and Rey Mysterio. They had a lot of great chemistry. Probably, I, w I would say personally that Chavo's best matches, I would say, in WWE were with Rey Mysterio. I mean, of course, he had some really, really good matches over in WCW too. But I can't think of many matches that he had in WWE that really stood out as special. You know, like in 05, he was doing the whole Kerwin White gimmick. What, what the fuck that, you know? And even when he had, you know, later on, when they had series of matches in 06 and later on in 07 too, they had some really, really good matches. But then after that, Guerrero was basically a joke. You know, he had matches with CM Punk, Kane in 2008, Jamie Noble, Hornswoggle, God forbid, in 09. He did next to nothing in 2010 and 2011. So, um, yeah, I would certainly say, I think there really is not much debate Unless there's another feud or a match that's not coming to mind that is best matches. Other than, you know, the tag matches with Eddie, his best singles matches in WWE were easily with Rey Mysterio. I don't think there's much doubt about that, much debate about that. So after that, a triple threat match, number one contenders match for the WWE Championship. The winner got a shot at the belt at WrestleMania 20. Kurt Angle, Big Show, and John Cena. Big Show was the then United States Champion. Big Show was the also the runner-up in the 2004 Royal Rumble match, so... Um, every man had a had a claim to the championship at Mania, of course, to set up Big Show and John Cena. Cena at one point, you know, delivered an FU to Big Show. I would have saved that for the grand stage, but that's kind of nitpicking. Um, really good match, a typical big fight feel, and that a lot of people, you know, everyone involved hit their finishers at one point or another. A lot of near falls. So in that respect, you know, hitting a finisher, kicking out, and breaking up the pinfall can get tiresome after a while. But in this match, for me anyway, that formula worked. 
Sometimes it could be very hit or miss, but in this match specifically, I thought it worked. Worked to perfection. They had a very fun match. In the end, Kurt Angle won to become the number one contender to the title at Mania. I believe at this point he was already a heel. And Lesnar was, of course, already a... He, he was a baby face. Um, no, I'm sorry. It was, you know... Ed, I'm thinking... Lesnar, I'm thinking, is the champion. He's not. Or at least at this point. He was at this point. And when the match was held, I'm thinking... Um, in, in terms of Eddie, he was the baby face. And Angle went heel to feud with him in WrestleMania. But I think Angle went heel before this match took place. I believe, anyway. And it was funny, too, because Angle and Cena would have a match on this show in, in the form of a triple threat, also involving Big Show. And I believe they had another match, and I have not yet finished No Way Out 2005, so I'm, I'm pretty sure, but I'm not 100% sure. They had another match the next year, one-on-one -on -one match, with the winner facing the WWE Champion at WrestleMania, with John Cena winning that time. So these guys had, in my opinion, like I've said to John before, I've said to many people before, you know, Cena and Angle, to me, was like the Cena punk of the early 2000s. From their history in 02 up until Angle left in 06. You know, they didn't have any matches at all in 06, from what I remember. But they did have many matches in 05. So, 02 to 05, I felt like Punk and Cena. For the matches they had from, you know, 2010, 2009 to 2013. From 02 to 05 were the matches that those guys had in, in WWE. Cena, Angle, and then Cena and Punk. A common theme, a common theme with John Cena. So anyway, really fun match there. Angle, the new number one contender. We get to the main event for the WWE Championship. Eddie Guerrero contending for the gold against Brock Lesnar. All the stars aligned. Goldberg was sitting in attendance, or he was already kicked out of the arena at that point. So people figured, oh, he won't be a factor in the finish. But he would. He came back. He took out Brock Lesnar, set up Eddie Guerrero for the frog splash. But even before that, a great technical wrestling match. And Lesnar nowadays is, you know, mostly, you know, German suplex, German suplex, clothesline, F5. You know, that's basically his repertoire now, but it's so entertaining it works. Back then, he was, of course, more of a wrestler. And, um, you know, he and Eddie had a great Matt classic, I would say. Not like technical wrestling, but um, I think that's what I said before. But, you know, just a very Matt-based wrestling uh, matchup. Matt-based Matt wrestling contest here between Eddie and Brock. A lot of good chemistry. Eddie had that, you know, David Goliath dynamic going for him against Brock, the, the much bigger in size Brock Lesnar, the Beast Incarnate, as you as he would later be known as. So great chemistry there. Crowd was thoroughly behind Eddie Guerrero. I got to check where this was held. I forgot the state or the uh, the town. So it was San Francisco. A lot of you know a high Latino population. You could see it in the crowd. Chavo talked about it before on the Talk Is Jericho podcast. So they were rallying behind Eddie Guerrero to win his first world championship. He came close, he came close, he kept on kicking out of Brock Lesnar's power maneuvers. And then in the end, with a little help from Goldberg, he was able to beat Brock Lesnar with the frog splash, pinned him for the 1-2-3, won his first WWE title, place goes crazy, great commentary from Cole and Taz, almost crying from all the emotion and how happy people were, or how happy you know fans were to see Eddie Guerrero finally win his first world championship, Eddie celebrating with his family at ringside. And it's funny, I'd never seen this match before, I watched it a couple months ago with John. He showed it to me. Well, we watched it on the network back in November. But watching it back again, even better the second time around. Like one of those matches that not even... I mean, it's mostly remembered for the moment itself. But even the match itself was really, really good. The moment of Eddie winning his first world championship will obviously stand the test of time. But even the match itself I thought was great and definitely worth a look. So great match, great moment, and a great way to kick off or rather to end... Um, a pretty entertaining No Way Out pay-per-view. So that was No Way Out 2004. I mean, needless to say, if there's any one match from the show to check out, it is Eddie Guerrero versus Brock Lesnar, if only for the final few ma for the final few minutes, the final few moments. But the match itself is also worth a look because it's so damn good. Um, but the rest of the show also very held up, uh, you know, very very well. I thought the Brock and Goldberg, you know, storyline progression was very well done. Um, good angle there. The crowd was behind that. The triple threat match between Angle, Cena, and Show was very, very good. The Cruiserweight title match was great. The final three matches, I thought, were all home runs. They were all great, which made this show worth watching alone. Um, but even the undercard really wasn't that bad at all. I thought it was a pretty entertaining show. Holly and Rhino was decent. The World's Greatest Tag Team versus APA was a fine match. Noble and Nidia, comedy match, you know, you know, filled the time nicely. And the opener was all right for what it was for the tag team titles, Rikishi, Scotty Tuhati, Passion Brothers, and Shaniqua. But that was No Way Out 2004. Check it out. I give it a thumbs up. Or I'll give it two thumbs up. I thought the final three matches were great. So check it out. No Way Out 04 setting up WrestleMania 20. 
So that's it, guys. Thank you for watching and listening. As always, I appreciate your support. And I'll be back on, I think Tuesday this is going up. I think this is going up on Saturday, but my next video will be up on Tuesday with my full review of No Way Out 2005. But until then, you guys can follow me on the Twitter at WrestleRant. Find me and follow me on Facebook at facebook.com backslash graham.gsm.matthews. Be sure to like, comment, share, and subscribe. As I said earlier, all your support is greatly appreciated. Stay tuned until Tuesday for my full review of No Way Out 2005. Until then, guys, have a great rest of your weekend. I'm Graham Gsm Matthews, and I'll catch you folks down the road.